We're going to do the last week of Love Like Jesus. We've been watching these key moments in his life, in his ministry, some things that he says, but a lot of what he does, because he's great at modeling this, because one more time I get to remind you that he himself, Jesus, is God's greatest expression of love. There's no question about it. The Bible points to that, that it's the greatest expression that God could give us. And even, even the disciples would say later in the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, John would just say God is love. And Jesus is that example. And so Jesus was aware of this as well. And he talked to Nicodemus about this, about why he came. And he simply said this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. And whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. God didn't send his Son into the world to condemn it, but to save the world through him. And so we've been talking about these moments in Jesus' ministry and where uh, he would tell us this is what love looks like. It's one thing for him to say it, but what I love about Jesus, especially the challenging things we have to learn, is that Jesus was wise enough and smart enough and also cunning enough to say, I not only can tell you to do this, I did it. And so that's one of those moments today. And so when we share the gospel with others, we get to share in this kind of love, and it should point people to Jesus. And this is what this series is about. It's not making sure that we're better at loving people. It's about loving like Jesus so that people can receive God's love and join his family. So again, the life and ministry of Jesus, we have four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then pretty much the rest of the New Testament talks about Jesus, and the Old Testament is pointing towards Jesus. So he pops onto the scenes of history. God becomes a man, a real person, and he challenges us. And he says, you know what, I'm not just here for you, but what I do should change something in you. And it should motivate you to show that love to everybody around you. Which if you know anything about love, sometimes it's hard to do that. So he tells us how to do it. But then he even better, I love that he models for us what to do. And that's what this series is about. I don't want you just to observe these moments and say, that's awesome. Amen. Good job, Jesus. He's doing it for a reason. He wants us to pay attention to see what love looks like. So we've seen how Jesus forgives people, how Jesus brings healing, how Jesus breaks bread intentionally with people who are far from Jesus and says, I'm here for them. I'm not here for the righteous. I've come to call those sinners. But today, Jesus, in one of the last moments of his life, this is what he does. Moment number four, Jesus just sets the example and he begins to serve other people. The passage that we're looking at today highlights what the Bible writers would tell us, one of the final moments of Jesus' life here on earth. Many believe this takes place probably the night before or the night before the night that he was crucified. And I don't know about you, but if I know that, and I know that what's about to happen might be the last moment of someone's life and their influence, I'm paying extra attention. So again, it's the night before Jesus would go to the cross, the night before his trial. Uh, Jesus and his followers are in Jerusalem. They're there to celebrate a very important meal, the Passover meal. And it's a big deal to celebrate this meal together. And I want you to read and watch what happens. In John chapter 13, I'll just do verses 1 to 5 right now. It says, it was just before the Passover feast. And listen to all of this introduction that John gives us. He sets in motion what Jesus is thinking and feeling and based on all of that, what Jesus does. It says, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. That's a heavy statement. Jesus knew it was time. Having loved his own who were in the world... He now showed them the full extent of his what? His love. The evening meal was being served, and John is very careful to let us know what Jesus knows. It says, And the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Very heavy statements. And because of all of that, here's how John connects it. He says, So, knowing all that, Jesus got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. In this moment, knowing all of this, Jesus makes a very important choice. He serves. And this is nothing new for Jesus. It shouldn't surprise us. He's been serving people for years. But this time, it's different. This time, we put our radar all the way up. Jesus chooses to serve to set an example. He chooses to serve because he's setting the example and showing what's required from all of his followers. So why is this time different? There's a lot packed into the Gospel of John. 
So they're about to sit down to a meal together, a very important meal. It was customary around this time of year for hundreds of thousands of Jews to come from all over the ancient world to come to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. But this particular meal with the fast-paced ministry of Jesus, they didn't have a lot of time to get prepared. In earlier chapters, you see that it was planned last minute. Other gospel writers would say Jesus just pretty much told them, you guys go here, you guys go here, and we'll get together. It was very last minute. But one of the key components in planning such a large celebration kind of meal is that you would need to schedule servants to serve the meal, to clean up after the meal, to serve the guests, especially the guests of honor and whatever they might need. But one of the tasks that would need to be handled by the servants, especially in a Jewish meal like this, is there needed to be somebody to wash and dry the feet of those attending the party. Now, this, last, this meal was put together last minute. So it's okay if you do things at the last minute. Jesus and his followers did things at the last minute. It's okay. There are no servants for any of these jobs. Now, if you can put yourself in the room, there isn't a single person there who would even think, well, I'm going to wash everybody else's feet because of what that job entailed. It wasn't just a job for a servant. The Bible is very clear. It was a job reserved for the servant to the servants. So before this meal, in other Gospels, a Gospel writer would let us know that on the way to this meal, some other disciples had decided to start asking Jesus what would happen. Because Jesus is being very clear that I'm going to give my life, and by doing that, I would establish my kingdom on earth. And so instead of asking these guys, asking Jesus what this might look like and how they could serve, two of them argued and began to beg Jesus to give them a special place on his right and a special place on his left. And even earlier, this, these disciples' mom would get involved. Now, if mom gets involved, it's, it's over. Mom asked Jesus, can one of my sons sit on your left and sit on your right? And so this is the conversation on the way to this meal. So you can see that one disciple serving another disciple would be humiliating. It would even threaten their position in what they thought the kingdom would look like. In fact, jockeying for position like this would come up frequently with the disciples. Listen, they had no problem doing ministry alongside Jesus. No problem. But when it came time to serve, especially serving each other, Jesus had some hard lessons to teach. In fact, most of the rebukes from Jesus to his disciples centered around how they treated each other. And so we get to John chapter 13. Instead of Jesus teaching again about service, he stands up, he grabs some water and a towel, And he models what service looks like. Now, we have some information, obviously, about who's sitting at the table. We have some information about what some of those people are planning to do. So you've got to imagine the emotion that Jesus is feeling. This is a moment where he's tapping into his divine power, and God is revealing to him some things that are about to happen. And it's in those moments you get a glimpse of the divine nature of Jesus. He's fully God and fully man. And in these moments, it's, it's kind of confusing to our minds. Jesus is sitting there. He's fully man. He's serving. And then all of a sudden, God says, there's someone at this table that's going to betray you. Yeah, and, and I know that because the devil's already prompted him to do that. So he knows what's about to happen. Jesus knew that he would be betrayed by one of his disciples in a matter of hours. Then Jesus also knew that he would also be disowned by another disciple shortly after that. And then Jesus had to know that he would be deserted by the rest of them when he would need them the most. And what does he still choose to do? Love them. Serve them. So you've got to imagine what's going through their minds. Now, some of them aren't going to blurt out what they're thinking, except Peter's at the table. And he's going to tell you what he's thinking. So it says, Jesus starts to wash their feet. It says, Jesus comes to Simon Peter in verse 6, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, listen, this is key. You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. And Peter should have just been like, yes, Lord, I understand. He says, no, 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 no. You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, my hands and my head as well. Give me a bath. I mean, can you, can you feel what Peter is feeling? He, the things that he says are almost amusing, but he's saying, listen, I'm watching Jesus watch other people's feet. And all the while, he's coming closer to me. I think seeing his master act like a servant must have been very confusing for Peter. He didn't understand what he was doing. 
And he definitely didn't want Jesus doing this task. And deep down, I think he's a little bit upset at himself that he didn't go grab the towel first. We do that to ourselves. But what was Jesus doing? He was teaching. He was modeling that to be a follower of Jesus, a person must be a servant. Jesus did not wash his disciples' feet to get them to be nice to each other. His greater goal was to extend the mission that he started on earth long after he would be gone. He was modeling that these men were to move from this moment and go into the world by doing one thing, serving God, serving each other, and serving people. Washing feet was the lowliest of the lowest jobs, even for a servant. And one commentator would put it this way, if even Jesus, God in the flesh, is willing to serve this way, We also must choose to be servants. Now, we could end there. We could go home, and you could say, that was the quickest sermon Pastor Eric has ever preached. Awesome. I can't believe how early we're getting out. I got some things to do. Now, we could walk out in agreement that obviously we should serve other people. Good job, Jesus. Thanks for the example. Most of us would agree with this. We understand what Jesus is trying to accomplish, but I think there's something more that we need to understand. Something we need to embrace. Something that you need to get into your heart and we all need to get into our hearts. This is not about a choice to serve. Here's the challenge. It's about making the choice to live a life of service. I'll say it again because there is a difference. It's not about a choice to serve. It's about making the choice to live a life of service. There's a difference. And if you want to know why, I'll be glad to tell you. I really believe this. Here's what the choice to serve might look like. Well, I'll serve when the time is right. I'll serve when it makes sense. I'll serve when it's convenient for me and I have nothing else on my schedule. I'll serve and I'll do something that I like to do. And I'll serve hoping that someone notices and I get recognition. That's the choice to serve. Do you want to know what a life of service looks like? It's someone who can say this, the time might not be right or convenient. The task might be menial or something I don't like. No one might ever see what I'm about to do, but I will serve because of what Jesus has done for me. It's about the choice to live a life of service. So Jesus models this, being a servant. Not just serving, he is being a servant. Because what he's doing is he's calling this an example. You'll see it later when he talks to the disciples. When he does this, it should be understood by all of us that the emphasis is not really on the act itself, but on the inner attitude of humble and voluntary service for other people. Now, in order to better understand this, I'm going to go off the norm. I'm going to go to another passage of Scripture. This passage is not about a moment in Jesus' life. This passage is not something that we'll observe Jesus saying or even doing, but I believe this next passage helps us further interpret what Jesus is modeling because somebody who was close to Jesus and whose life was transformed by Jesus helps us understand the difference between choosing to serve and being a servant. Now remember, why are we going to other Scripture? Because Scripture does interpret Scripture. It does. So I want you to go to the book of Philippians. If you're in John, you just turn right and keep going. The book of Philippians, I want us to listen to the words of Paul. Some of you may have heard this before, but in this passage, you can see that it is clearly laid out that a life of service is possible. Pretty much what Paul is saying and has said almost his entire life, he says, because of what Jesus has done, Paul lays out not only the need to serve, but the decision to have an attitude and the lifestyle of a servant. Now, here's the truth when it comes to Service in the church. Serve is not a, a foreign word to church. We, we get people to fall in love with Jesus, and then the next thing is we want them to serve Jesus. We've heard it all the time. See, pastors and leaders, we've spent a lot of time and energy, I'll just be honest with you, thinking of creative ways to inspire people to serve. Now, I'll just let you know, I'll pull a little curtain back, some of the things that we do as pastors. There are entire conferences devoted to other leaders, helping other leaders to help their people to get them to have the desire to serve. There are millions of ways to do this. Sometimes they'll pull on your heartstrings a little bit. 
They'll pull at your emotions. They'll show you pictures and videos. It's like those, sorry that if you love animals more than I do, but it's like those videos that show the sad puppies and then they want you to give all your money to the sad puppies. I'm not, sorry, I'm not doing it. But it, it, the, what, the, what they'll, they'll inspire you, they'll put a big thing up there and say, let's call this a call to serve. And, and listen, it, there's a million ways to do this, and I think most of them do inspire people to serve. But what I'm starting to see is a lot of those methods and practices lead people to make the choice to serve rather than a life of service. So I want to make the resolve in my heart today that what we're about to read, what we're about to explore, and hopefully gets into your heart, is a summary of the best reason and reasons to choose a life of service. It's not a, I'm not going to read to you from a conference. I'm not going to show you a video on how many cool videos, on how many sad testimonials to inspire you, because I'm not interested in that. My hope is that the words of Scripture would be sufficient enough for you not to just make a choice once in a while to serve, but you would say, my life needs to be a life of service. So again, if you don't like these reasons, take it up with the department upstairs, because Paul lays it out very clearly why we should do this. So think of this question as Paul's writing this in Philippians chapter 2. He says, why should we choose a life of service? Here's one of the answers. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ. Listen, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we are in a vital union with Jesus. The Son of God. The Bible says we are adopted as sons and daughters. You aren't just friends and acquaintances. You are sons and daughters. But because of this unique relationship, this is where it hurts a little bit, there are obligations that come with that. We are responsible to heed the orders of Jesus as issued by him or those who would be responsible for speaking for him. This should be in the forefront of all of our hearts that I should serve because I have encouragement, because I have union with Jesus. In fact, later in John 13, do you know what Jesus point blank said to these men around the table asking them, why are you doing this? He said, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. It doesn't get any more clear than that. Jesus said, because we're in relationship together and you get to see this firsthand. I would love for him to just in that moment to say, you get to see this and experience it. Everybody else gets to read about it. You, I'm setting you an example for you to do what I've done. So why should we choose a life of service? Well, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, then you serve. Then he's not done. In the same verse, he says, if there's any comfort from his love. Because of Jesus' love for us, I hope that you know there should be comfort and encouragement in our hearts all the time. And I think what that love should do should prompt us to join hands with others in common acts of service. Our love for Jesus and for each other should almost activate our hearts, not for moments of service, but a life of service. And he says, I'm not done yet. He says, if there's any fellowship with the Spirit, that's different. That sets us apart from everybody in the Old Testament because we have all been made one. Paul talks about this in other letters to church. He said, we've all been made one by the Spirit of God. We're all one. He says there's no Jew, there's no Greek, which was very much a hot point of contention, nor slave, nor free, nobody. He says there's nothing. We're all baptized by one spirit into who God is. And then he would go on to say that you kind of have the stamp that you belong to him. It's an inheritance kind of thing. And he says then that because of that, you have an opportunity and a privilege to partner with what the spirit is doing. God trusts us enough to say, I could do all this by myself, but you guys are my representatives, which is why he told the churches in Revelation, you overcome by the blood of the lamb. God says, I did that, but then you overcome by the testimony. You do that. That's why we choose to live a life of service because our lives should be the desire and the expression of the Holy Spirit. If those three aren't enough, I'll give you another reason. He says, if you have any tenderness or compassion... If there's any tenderness in your heart, let it flow into a life of service, even if it's a little tiny bit. If there's any compassion in your hearts, let that flow into a life of service. When Jesus overlooked, right before these moments, when he looked over Jerusalem, it says he was filled with compassion and he wept for the city. So if these things are true, Paul says, then what's next? He moves to verse 2. He says, then Paul's writing to a church that he really loves. 
And he says, you would make my joy complete if you did these things. Be like-minded and have the same love. I hope you know that there's a bond that kind of binds us all together when we choose to have a life of service. What we shouldn't want is to come to church for a show. We shouldn't want to come to church just to hang out. But man, there's something when people start to serve together. There's a bond there that really can't be... I don't have a word for it. I really don't. But you know, if you've experienced it, you know it. Can I get some head shakes? Like you've, yeah, you've experienced... Okay, good. I thought I was the only one. But it's not our common interest. It's not our working hard together that accomplishes what God has. It's that bond that we have when we serve. The thing that binds us all together is what he says. We have that same love, the love from Jesus. Now, we accomplish much more in the kingdom if, if we do it together than doing it alone. Imagine the ways the world would be impacted if this kind of love bound us together for not just moments of service, but lives of service. And not just moments where we just choose to serve, but we become servants. Then he says, okay, if this is true, I want you to be like-minded, having the same love. Then he says, I want you to be one in spirit and purpose. This one's really simple. If we're making the choice to live a life of service, it should make sense that all of us should be making the same choice. See, sometimes the frustrating things that nobody wants to talk about is it seems like a lot of the same people understand this and they're the ones that keep going and it's hard to motivate others to do it. But I'm, I feel free in this moment. It's not my job to motivate. Though your love for Jesus is the thing that should motivate you to have a life of service. I can talk to you about it. I can use those things from conferences and books to kind of try to motivate you and challenge you. But I have to pray and believe that if you're one in spirit, and S is capitalized, that's the Holy Spirit, and in purpose, it will flow into a life of service. We all do it together. Now, this is where you put your seatbelt on because this one hurts a little bit. Then he says, okay, if those things are true, then what do we do next? Well, then it says you do nothing. Everybody say nothing. Nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Here's what I know to be true. Selfishness and service never go together. Never. Selfishness and service never go together. You know why? Because you've got to choose one or the other. In fact, that's the major difference, I think, when you make a choice to serve or when you choose to have a life of service. Because selfishness, when it comes to serving, is convenient. Service is not. Selfishness, at the end of the day, will glorify yourself. Service glorifies others, and it glorifies Jesus every time. And in fact, one pastor said to us in a group of pastors one time, it was a statement that I liked to write down, but then when I got home and thought about it, I didn't like. He says, a lot of ministry is preparing parties for other people. It's not for you. That's what it's about. Think about the father and the prodigal of the lost son. You know whose party he was planning? The one who hurt him the most. He was planning his party. He had people steaming the robes and getting everything ready, fatting the calf. And everybody's like, what are we fatting the calf for? And he says, for when he comes home. That's service. Selfishness always chooses me and what I want. Service chooses Jesus and what others need every time. Here's what I know. It's easy to make the choice to serve once in a while. Anybody can do that. I believe you can inspire anybody to serve once or twice. But the mark of a Jesus follower is this, making the unselfish choice to live a life of service. And here's how I know it. Here's how my mentors spoke it to me. This could mean that you say yes to Jesus long before he gives you the job description of what you're saying yes to. Can you do that? That's a life of service. That's what these disciples were signing up for. They thought their time was done when Jesus' ministry was done. He says, I'm just preparing you for what's next. In fact, wait in Jerusalem, and then I'll send my spirit, and then things are going to go crazy. That's not a direct quote. That's my understanding. But that's what he's saying. Listen, this could mean that you might say yes in a life of service. Yes, Jesus, I will serve you. I will have a life of service. And he hasn't given you the job description yet. But here's where the difference is. I think those who choose to serve once in a while, you know what they usually wait for? 
They wait for the job description before they say yes. There's a big difference. And then he says, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but the interests of others. This speaks again to the condition of the heart. Selfishness or service. Because self-centeredness, really, you know what it considers? That's my rights. That's my plans. That's my time. That's my energy. That's my interest. That comes first. And unfortunately, this leaks into our family, which leaks into the church, which leaks into the world, and it determines how and when and if we will serve. And I think what he's saying here is this type of thinking needs to be broader, that it considers other people. Now listen, we don't neglect our own lives. We don't neglect our own family. You have to be very careful, especially when you throw yourself into service for Jesus. Paul would give a very stern warning to Timothy. He says, if anybody neglects his family... And he's talking about those who serve for Jesus. He says, if they neglect their own family, they're worse than an unbeliever. So it's not saying you ignore everybody that loves you, because that's not biblical. What he's saying is this speaks to the necessity that others are always part of your thinking. Others are always part of your life of service. If you're a parent, it's really hard to train young kids to think of other people. I thought I'd get a resounding amen on that one. It's really hard. Because usually their first word is either no or mine. And so you first teach them how to share with each other, and there's usually toys that get thrown around and things get broken on purpose. Oh, I didn't know I broke her. Yeah, you did. You knew you broke it on purpose. But then at Christmas time, when we try to inspire our kids, hey, we're going to give gifts away. And, and I can't blame my kids because their, their hearts are innocent and they're pure, and they're just going to say what's on their minds. We're all thinking it, but the kids actually say it. And they're like, okay, if we're giving that many gifts away, I know without fail, one of my kids says, well, how many do I get? I'm like, okay, I understand that, but just to keep doing this for others, it has to be a lifestyle. Not that you neglect your own. And don't, we're not nasty parents. We don't give our kids zero presents and then give everybody else presents. But we have it in their heart that really it is better to give than it is to receive. And just this week, you know, of course, when grandma comes to town, she doesn't come empty-handed, right? Any grandparents... Or parents now that are like, yeah, I know every time. It's like, Mom, you don't have to bring something every time. She does. So she brought them something that is almost as worth its weight in gold. She bought them $5 gift cards to Five Below, which if you have not been to Five Below with somebody under the age of 10 or 15 even, it's like a gold mine in there. It's like the dollar store on steroids, and everything is $5 or below. And so, you know, Parker goes, he's excited, he knows exactly where he's running to. Haley, all it has to say is Peppa Pig on it, and she's got it. And then Kylie, her heart, and and I believe this is the heart of Jesus, she gets what she wanted, and she had money left over. And we didn't tell her, we didn't prompt her. She comes home, she got what she wanted, which was nails, fake nails, I don't understand. We're in big trouble because she's only six. But then she comes home and she's got candy. And I'm like, oh, you picked candy. She's like, no, this candy is for Parker and for Haley. She used her money on somebody else. And of course, the other kid's like, wait, I got more gifts. And I'm like, did you say thank you? Because she did that on her own. And that's just, it's cool to see that when you start to show a lifestyle of service. And so what again, what does Paul say? He says, listen, if you want to do this, if you have any encouragement from being an eye with Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship with the Spirit, any tenderness or compassion, make his joy complete. Be like-minded, same love, one in spirit. Don't do things out of selfish ambition. Think of other people. And then here's the most important statement. He says, if all of that is true, here's the most important thing he says. You know what he says? He says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. He could just end it right there. And that's a little bit of a burn. Hey, your attitude should be just like Jesus. But then he almost puts in a song of the ancient church, and this is what it says. If you want to know what the attitude was of Jesus, it says, Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or something that he had to hold on to. But listen to this. But he made himself nothing. Taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So again, it's as if 
Paul is writing these words saying, you know who the greatest example is of anybody who's going to give their life to service? It's Jesus. This lets us know that Jesus made the choice not just to serve, but his life was an act of service. He's the only person born in history that was born so that he could die. That was his job. And the theologians would tell us what this song is really telling us is that for moments in Jesus' life, he would empty himself of the form of God. That's, that blows my mind. He emptied himself of the form of God. Now, there are Gospels that are written that are not in our Bible, and there's good reason why, like the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Judas, which was written after Judas died. I don't know how that happened. But it would say things like, you know, when Jesus was a young boy and he got mad at his friends, he would use his powers and he'd like knock them over. That's not in Jesus' character. It says all the time that he emptied himself of being God. And probably the most prominent moment is when he was tempted by the devil. And the devil said, you could, you could knock everything out right now. You could make that stone into bread. You could do this. And he just, in those moments, he emptied himself. of who, And he made the choice to be a servant He emptied himself of the form of God, and he became one of us. I mean, did you catch that? There's no other world religion that will tell you that. God said, I'm going to empty myself of my God-like characteristics and my nature and my power, and I'm going to become one of them and serve them and have a life of service, hoping that they'll do the same. He didn't empty himself from God once in a while. He emptied himself in the form of God to live a life of service. Just didn't say he took on the nature of man. God becomes man, incarnation. That's, our, that's in our doctrine. But he took on the nature of a servant. In fact, when B- Jesus would call people to follow him, you know what he would try to tell them? He says, I don't know where I'm sleeping tonight. I don't know where I'm eating today. I'm here to serve. I didn't come for the righteous. I came for the sinners. It, he modeled it. So if it stings a little bit, Jesus is like, I've been there. Paul is saying, if any of these things are true, because Jesus laid down his life, we have union with God. We are one in spirit and purpose. We don't do anything out of selfish ambition because Jesus didn't, so we shouldn't. We look at other people's interests above our own. And if you need any more examples, Jesus did it. He took on the nature of a servant. So the challenge, it's not about a choice to serve. It's the choice to live a life of service. See, what Jesus does so perfectly is he models over and over and over again how to be a servant, not just serving. And it's really not on the act itself. He's calling into our attitudes and our hearts, which really have to be the main ingredients when you serve. It's your heart and your attitude behind it. Man, I, I'm like hearing the words of my mom being drilled into my head now. You know, you serve grandma and pap. You, you do things for other people. You know, my mom was a single mom, so it fell on us. We, we you know, we, we step up and we do things. My uncle would always give us wood for our fireplace, but I had to take it from the outside and put it in the inside and stack it inside. And, and my mom said, your heart's not in it. And I said, well, I, my heart doesn't need to be in it. My hands are doing it. And I, you don't say that to mom. And I would roll my eyes. She said, you can roll those eyes right up to your room. And, I have, and she said, you can watch your friend sled today instead of you sledding. So, I, th- yeah, I get it. It's been drilled in there. It's one thing to just do it. But, man, if your heart's not in it, don't do it. That's what I would say. I would say don't do it. The choice to serve versus a life of service. So I have some questions for you today. I'm not going to have a sign-up sheet to serve. I'm not going to show you a sappy video or emotion. I'm not going to do that because... Jesus models this for us. So here's some questions. How's your heart? How's your inner attitude? Are you okay making small choices to serve every once in a while? Or are you ready to make the choice to live a life of service? I'll take this even further. Do you want your life to mean something? Who doesn't want their life to mean something? Maybe I should do it that way. I mean, do you want your life to mean something? Do you want to find joy in life? Do you want to wake up every day and go to sleep every night with that kind of joy? I would say here's a really simple answer. Give your life away in service. Give it away. And I promise you what's going to happen is that I believe life is found when you give your life away. And I'll echo the words of a great missionary who never got to see what his service looked like, by the way. Jim Elliott says this. He says, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He writes that in his journal. Two days later, he's killed by the very people that he gave his life to serve. And now there's thriving churches all over that area. I'll tell you what, you give your life away in service, and I promise you, you'll find life. 
Is it going to be hard? Absolutely. Is it going to be inconvenient? Almost every time. Is it going to be more about others and less about yourself? Is that going to frustrate you in your human nature? Probably. But I want to live like Jesus and I want to love like Jesus. In a tense room of people who would betray him and disown him and were mad that he didn't pick who to be on the left and the right, he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to show them what's most important. I'm going to serve them. And then two days later, he said, I'm going to show them how much I'll serve them. I'll give my life for them. And you know how I know that it impacted them? Because 11 out of the 12 who were in that room gave their lives for Jesus. They did. They, they gave the ultimate act of service. Peter was crucified upside down. James was beheaded. John was the only one that survived his assassination attempt. They tried to boil him alive and he survived. So then they threw him on a prison island and then he wrote the book of Revelation for us. I mean, Matthew was martyred. Thomas, all the, they all lost their lives for Jesus because they knew they said, you know, I'm going to give my life away in service. They understood what it was like. And it falls to us generations and generations and generations later, will we serve? So the question is, will you choose to serve or will you live your life being a servant? Let's stand as we pray together today. Heavenly Father, we take this charge serious, Lord. It weighs heavy on our hearts. God, first of all, I want to pray for those in this room that have already made a choice to live a life of service. God, with that comes weariness. With that comes unmet expectations sometimes. With that comes being let down. Sometimes it means self-sacrifice. And Lord, the Bible is very clear that sometimes a life of service, we won't get to see the benefits of that until we get to heaven. We won't. But God, I pray that you would keep modeling for us and keep showing us a life of service rather than just choosing to serve. And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would bring conviction where it needs to bring conviction to those of us who may say, I'm okay choosing to serve every once in a while when it's convenient or when it falls in the right time or this has to happen and this has to happen. Lord, I, may we not do it for other people. May we not do it for their recognition. May we not do it to please somebody else. But God, how, would you get into the innermost parts of our heart and you ask us, are you okay just choosing to serve? Or can I count on you for a life of service? And Lord, I pray that we would be the people that would say yes to a life of service before we're handed the job description. May we be those people. And God, would you bring us moments and moments of clarity where we see that the service is impacting somebody else? God, all of us are in this room because of somebody else choosing to serve. My, my family came to salvation in Jesus because there was a church full of people that lived lives of service and served our family when we needed it the most and pointed us to Jesus. May we do that for somebody else. May it not stop with us, but may the cycle continue. That is, those who have served us and helped us and got us to where we are, may we extend that to the next generation behind us to the people beside us, to the neighbors in our neighborhood, to the people at work. May we choose a life of service. God, you have set a great example by sending your son, Jesus. May we love like Jesus. May we forgive people who need forgiveness. May we believe for healing here and now and to do whatever it takes for desperate people to get into the presence of Jesus, saying, if I can just touch the edge of his coat, I will be healed. May we break bread with people who are far from Jesus. May we invite them to our table. And God, it may take weeks, it may take months, it might take years, but God, would we be the love of Jesus extended and to go after lost sheep? And Lord, would we cap all of that with the choice to live a life of service? Because God, we have encouragement from being united with you. We have a relationship with the Spirit. We have tenderness and compassion in our hearts. So we say today, we will be like-minded. We will have the same love and one in spirit and purpose. We won't do anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, 
but we will consider others better than ourselves. And we will not look only to our own interests, but to the interests of others. And we want our attitudes to be the same as yours. So be with us as we go from here, not just choosing to serve, but to live a life of service. And we pray that in Jesus' wonderful and precious name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday.